All righty. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Amy Garza. And on behalf of the Future Forum, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Welcome to today's uh, panel, Mopocalypse and Ubergeddon, How Will Austin Overcome Its Transportation Challenges? We, the Future Forum, are a public policy discussion forum with many events much like this one ahead. So we hope that you will please check out our membership table to the left uh, in order to get more information on membership as well as a calendar of upcoming events. Uh, we'd also like to note that our partners at the LBJ School are here as well to offer uh, information about their academic programs. So we're absolutely uh, happy to have them as well. <clears throat> Also want to remind you that we have a reception immediately following today's panel. Um, beginning this week, our newest sponsor, Carbach, Carbach Brewing Company, uh, will be available, so we're happy to welcome them. Um, now we'd like to introduce Ben Ware. Uh, ben covers transportation for the Austin American Statesman. He's an Austin native and a UT graduate. Uh, ben has worked for the Statesman since 1994 and has had the transportation beat since 2003. He also teaches journalism as an adjunct professor. And in the fall, he is a football official from everything to Pop Warner to high school, uh, high school football games. He is a proud father of M Molly, a sophomore at the University of Michigan. She's an aspiring actress and costume designer. Please join me in welcoming Ben Ware. I must have sent her an out-of-date uh, bio of Molly's a senior, so <laughs> the statesman regrets the error. Uh, let me introduce the panel. Uh, uh, Mayor Steve Adler to my left, a uh, Maryland native, a Princeton grad from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Affairs, then he got a law degree at UT. He had a long and distinguished career in the law, specializing in eminent domain and also civil rights employment discrimination law. And he served as El Paso State Senator Elliot Shapley's chief of staff the whole time, chief of staff for- uh, And general counsel. And general counsel for eight years. He was elected Austin mayor in November 2014 and has served uh, just, just under two years, uh, presiding over our revamped 10-1 council. And he's been very active from the beginning on transportation issues, including trying to broker a solution on the ride-hailing mess earlier this year. And he and his staff were the primary architects of the $720 million transportation bond that we're gonna talk about here in a minute. Um, D Joe Des Hotel, not Desh, Des Hotel, he's a Beaumont native, and he's the director of community engagement for Ride Austin. That's the nonprofit ride hailing company that sprung up in the, uh, by Austin entrepreneurs were behind it in the aftermath of uh, Uber and Lyft deciding to leave Austin. Before that, he was communications director for the Travis County Democratic Party, and at various times before that, a congressional aide and a state legislative aide. Ben Holland is a consultant and the project manager for the Rocky Mountain Institute's <coughs> Mobility Transi Transportation Initiative here in Austin. Uh, it's a multi-year project, and it was launched uh, about a year ago uh, to advance innovative solutions to Austin's transportation challenges. Among those initiatives, and he can tell you more about those in a minute, uh, is one to improve walkability in Austin through better land use and development practices. So the title that the, uh, the forum came up with, uh, uh, you know, a, a Mopocalypse and Ubergeddon, How Will Austin Overcome Its Transportation Challenges? And I was caught by the word overcome uh, as if we could just completely wash it all away, maybe mitigate, deal with, keep from swallowing us whole. I don't know about you, but every time I leave the house or the office or this place tonight, if it's, unless it's 10 o'clock at night, I think, can I get there in time? How, how will I go? And, and while you're in the middle of it, I, was, I left at five and was wondering if I would get here in time. Uh, I think about the mayor going from event to event to event. Um, I'm told that there used to be a helipad right up here uh, in LBJ's day, and you don't have a helicopter, right? No, but you need one. Um, so, in an attempt to deal with that, uh, we have the $720 million bond issue, and early voting starts Monday, and it's on the November 8th ballot. So, if it's passed, it would dwarf 
uh, transportation bonds for the city of Austin that have been passed since in five elections between 1998 and 2012, the total I believe is just under 640, 640 million. So this one would be larger than all of that. So Mr. Mayor, tell us what's, what is in this, uh, uh, you know, in as briefly as you can, and then how that would make a difference for the overwhelming majority of the people that have to deal with the things I was just talking about. Sure. Well, I, I begin uh, uh, what, what Ben said about the, the size of the bond is true, but let me put that in context for you. 183 project being built right now by RMA at Bluestein Boulevard out near the airport is by itself a six, $760 million project. 183 to the north northwest by itself is a 650 million dollar project. Every time we do a, a flyover lanes at an intersection of two highways, that's 250 million dollars, quarter of a billion dollars by itself. The fact that this city over 20 years has cumulatively altogether done 630 million dollars in bond elections is in part why we have the problem we have today because we've affirmatively chosen not to fix it by spending very little. On the same day we go vote on our $720 million bond election, the citizens of Seattle and that region, uh, about one and a half times the size of Travis County uh, as a region, will be going to uh, their polls and voting on a $27 billion transportation bond election. Uh, that's a city that's really serious about actually doing something about transportation long term. This bond package has three components to it. Uh, all of them are designed, uh, or, or the bulk of them designed to address congestion, uh, primarily um, uh, automobile throughput, delays at uh, intersections, uh, but also at the same time, because it's the same thing, laying the, the groundwork uh, for uh, a transit system to, to be able to work uh, in this city. Three buckets to the bond. First bucket is just under $500 million. It's taking the, the corridors that are our main congested roads in the city. The state is working on MOPAC and I-35 and 183. We, we have to do the, the other roads uh, in our city. Uh, Lamar Boulevard, uh, Burnett Road, North and South Lamar, Riverside Airport, MLK, William Cannon, uh, Slaughter Lane. These are the roads that, that two thirds of us live within a mile and a half of. Uh, these are our most congested roads, uh, other than the, than the highways. Uh, and, it, and it uses the existing right-of-way, because it's incredibly expensive to start acquiring additional right-of-way, in almost all the places it stays within the existing right-of-way, and that's the goal. Uh, and it uses the right-of-way we, right we have in a smarter way. So when you talk to all of the traffic engineers, they tell you that if you want to improve congestion and throughput, you have to use your right-of-way in as smart a way as you possibly can. And primarily that involves getting rid of the conflicts in traffic that exist so that cars move more quickly, and then doing the technology associated with the traffic lights and synchronization, which means moving cars more quickly, you put in right and left turn lanes at all the intersections. Uh, you, you put in bus pullouts so cars aren't stuck behind buses. You get the bicycles off the road so that you're not stuck behind bicycles. It means you take out the suicide lanes, the chicken lanes in the middle of streets. Big cities don't do chicken lanes, which is why you don't see that, that kind of mode being constructed uh, nowadays in, in big cities because of the conflicts and the turning movements. You take out the chicken lanes, you put in medians, you put in left series of left turn lanes uh, so as to steer traffic. Uh, it also, by the way, is, is, is 60 to 70 percent safer uh, than, a, than a suicide in a chicken lane, which also helps with uh, congestion. But that's that bucket. Uh, it's, it's taking those, con those, those corridors that have been studied intensely by this community over the last six to, to eight years, millions of dollars, hundreds of people, thousands of hours. These are the most vetted projects that, uh, uh, that we have in, uh, in our city. Uh, it has us actually moving to execute those. Austin does a great job in, in designing things and planning things, not as good a job in actually executing things over time. Uh, so it would have us execute those, and then it sets up the next series for planning. Uh, uh, Runberg Lane, Pleasant Valley Road, Colony Park, Manchac, so it sets up that next series. But that's that work. The next bucket, uh, a little over about 130, a little over $130 million is for uh, uh, other transportation elements, primarily sidewalks. It's safe passage for kids to school. Kids are now walking in the street and airport boulevard to get to, to school. 
safe passageway to school, safe passageway to, uh, to, to transit stations. That's what the bulk of that money is. Uh, but it also has some money for uh, the bicycle master plan, the urban trail master plan, about $20 million each for those. And then focusing on some of the most dangerous intersections in our city. That's the $130 million component. And then the last component is uh, pain points, primarily in West Austin, the folks that do not live proximate to the corridors we talked about a second ago. So some work on, uh, on uh, Loop 360, uh, Anderson Mill, Palmer Lane, 620 and uh, uh, 2222. Um, but again, uh, uh, it is work that is designed primarily to address congestion uh, in the city uh, and then secondarily, well not secondarily, two, two priorities, congestion uh, and uh, enabling in the future the ability for us to actually have mode shifts to, uh, to, to transit. And those priorities are set by a contract with voters that the council passed, which is the very first time our council has ever done anything like that so as to ensure that the next council or the council after that can't walk in and say, hey, let's spend this money differently on different priorities. So not to be the skunk at the party, but I have to ask you about some of the criticisms that Please. have been out there. Please. Um, the city staff has estimated that to build seven of the nine quarters that are potentially, or that are mentioned actually in the ballot line, which to build seven of the uh, nine would be 1.5 billion or more. There's 482 million in this bond, so voters will go to the ballot and they won't know if this particular one or this particular one or how much of this one will be done. So how do you answer that, that criticism? Well, I begin with by saying that we have nine and a half billion dollars in unmet transportation needs in the city. Part of the reason we're in the place that we're in, nine and a half billion dollars. And I would say that, that we shouldn't not spend money uh, because we don't have enough money to spend to do everything. We have a certain amount of money we can't we have. So the council went to the staff and we said there's a billion and a half uh, on these corridors. How much money would we have to raise in order to actually have a material and substantial impact on congestion? Uh, and they came back and gave us this number, and that's the number we used, about a little over four, $450 million. And then we set up a process that would be very public, so the public community could see. We're asking staff to go away, uh, take a look at how they can leverage that money, both at the state level and the federal level. All we have to do is watch what Hayes County did and Williamson County did in terms of their bond money in order to be able to, to leverage it and bring home more money, because you don't get money at the federal level and at the state level unless you come to the table with money and with projects and you can't really know exactly where it is that they're going to want that work done or how that work gets done. So we've laid out the priorities. We want to deal with congestion in this city and we have the money that's adopted for that. Staff has to go away, come back and make a recommendation to us as a community on these corridors where we can spend that money to have the greatest material impact. Uh, and it'll be very public, the whole community can see it, it's set by those priorities, and that's where we'll spend it. And part of it we can't know the answer to. Part of it may depend on who's developing property and who's willing to, to, to help fund in order to make their projects work, part of the program, or offset some of the costs associated with that. Um, well, the only thing we do know is that staff can't go away by themselves and start spending the money somewhere, and we all look up and say, well, where'd that money go? It's something that is done by a contract with the voters where the city is unable legally to spend that money unless it hits those priorities and unless it comes back to the council in a very public way to order. Uh, can we talk about lost lanes? I mean, you've already talked about the chicken lane question. Uh, the East Riverside plan contemplates uh, having bus only lanes and taking a six lane road and, and making it four lanes for the, for the remaining cars. Uh, also, I've reported that one of the plans says that uh, on South Lamar, that during rush hour, a lane would, would be uh, associated with, uh, would, would be allocated only for buses. The mayor, just a few minutes ago, tells me that I've got that wrong, that I need to look at the study again. So, go ahead. Well, uh, you know, that's a question that a lot of people ask. Is this corridor work dependent or built around removing through lanes for traffic in order to uh, create uh, dedicated lanes for buses or for bicycles? That may or may not be a good policy to do that, but this plan does not do that. This plan does not take away through lanes for either trains or buses. 
Uh, and, and you may catch a commercial that started airing today from the kind of the, the do-nothing voices in Austin suggesting uh, otherwise, as if we're doing that wholesale. It's not true. The only places in these plans where that is contemplated or discussed at all, not on Riverside, not on Airport, not on North Lamar, not on Burnett Road, on, on, on none of those projects. On Riverside Drive, it adds some, some parking lanes as was part of the, the, the urban rail design that was happening on that road. But as the council discussed it, the council said whether or not you keep in parking uh, and, and, or, or maximize the number of lanes, the question for, the only question, the only criteria on that question, parking versus through lanes is going to be how does that impact congestion? And that's the only place, other than the drag on Guadalupe in that area, which quite frankly is probably already a dedicated bus lane when you try to, to travel that area. No one's quite figured out exactly how to do that yet, and we need to figure out how to do that. On South Lamar, South Lamar report specifically says that there is insufficient right-of-way to be able to do a dedicated bus lane. There is, and in fairness to you, um, there is a chart uh, that's contained within that report. And if you go all the way down to the bottom of the chart, there's language that says that in the future, in the event that bus ridership should warrant it, you could have a, a, a bus lane. Well, I mean, that's a truism for me. If you, if you have suddenly buses that are all full and, 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 and somehow or another we have that conversion in time and, and ridership warns it because everybody's riding a bus, well then probably you do go that direction. But that's not what's contemplated in the, um, uh, in, in the plans as, as evidenced, I think, by what the, the, the text of what the report says. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. And I would urge people to push back hearing this because in Austin, confronted with two options of things to do, option A and option B, and I've been here for almost 40 years, the very first thing we'll do in this community is we'll look at those two options and we will prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that neither option A nor option B are perfect. Of course, no options ever are. But having conclusively proven that neither A nor B are perfect, this community will choose to do C, nothing. And it would have been better for us to have either chosen A or B, I think, in most cases. So I would urge people to push back against the message that we are taking away through travel lanes in order to make bus lanes. What they're talking about, if anything, are chicken lanes in the middle of the street. Those are not through lanes for traffic. And there's so much more we could do on that, but I want to make sure I get to both of them. Uh, Joe works for Ride Austin, as I said, and uh, in the wake of Uber and Lyft leaving on the Monday after the election, May 9th, uh, it wasn't long before uh, the one remaining uh, ride-hailing company we had, Get Me, was joined by Fair and Fasten, and then by June, from scratch, Ride Austin was formed. And so now there are multiple options and they are going through fingerprinting. I just wanted you to give us a sense of what's what the landscape is now for, for ride hailing in Austin uh, five months later. Right, well, the bottom line is people can get a ride when they want one. And we're doing tons of uh, advertising at the airport. So when you come down those escalators, as long as you're not actually looking at your Uber app wondering why it's not working, you'll see all of our signs. And uh, you actually, you know, at the information booth we have uh, advertising pretty much everywhere it's possible to get advertising in the airport. And then we work with uh, organizers of events uh, when they're coming into Austin, so on their itineraries, when they're telling folks, hey, when you fly in, make sure you download the app. And then we're doing things, of course, like we had the big partnership with Honda for ACL, uh, which was really great for us, helped raise the profile level of us. Also, uh, ACL was letting the travelers know that, hey, uh, you know, these other services aren't in town, but Ride Austin is, and you should download Ride Austin. And so uh, between us and the other companies, we were able, people were able to get rides. I sat down there um, almost every single day of ACL where we had a dedicated pickup and drop off location at uh, South Lamar and Riverside, and people were able to get rides, and I, we, we didn't have any crashes, the app never crashed. Uh, we can always use more drivers, of course, and we constantly are advertising that, and um, drivers have more options than they've ever had of companies to drive now, for. Now, I know Fair and Fast and don't share their numbers with you necessarily, but maybe you can help us. How many people have been uh, fingerprinted? How many drivers have been fingerprinted and approved through that process, if you have any idea? Well, the city did set up these benchmarks, and currently the benchmark right now is 50% of driver hours must be completed by fingerprinted drivers. We're well over that, I think, in our, our last report we are at something like 89% or something. Uh, I'm sure that number has come down as we've 
expanded, but we are well over the, uh, what the, the current benchmark is, and we'll continue to be well over whatever the benchmark is at any given time. I will tell you, after the first UT game, I did get a few emails from people saying, well, I had to wait an hour, or, and I finally gave up and walked or you know, got a cab or tried to get a cab. Have there been some problems, some implementation problems for people uh, trying to get a ride through ride hailing. I think it's a, a lot of it is a scale issue. And that's kind of what the mayor was saying, like whatever happens, there's gonna be time that, that these companies are gonna need to scale up. And so what the fingerprinting thing did in the very beginning was slow that time down. From the very beginning, we had to get to sort of amass a the number of drivers who had gone through that process. And then if you look at those charts that you're talking about, which we post on our Facebook weekly, uh, our volume, ride volume charts, you'll see how it's gone up just like that. Um, and so it took us 31 days to give our first 10,000 rides. Uh, and this day seven, like it's uh, day 120, we've, um, we've given about 300,000 rides. Um, so the curve of number of rides we've given is exponential and it continues to grow. Uh, the mayor participated in a panel at the Trib Fest where there were uh, three other, I think, legislators there, and at least two of them were very determined to pass a statewide bill and, and uh, uh, backed by Uber and Lyft that would uh, set statewide regulations for ride hailing and probably based at least on what the form they've said and what I've been hearing from legislators, if it passes, and it, I think it might, the requirement for, for fingerprinting would go away. So would, would, would Ride Austin still require fingerprinting if it wasn't the law? Well, first of all, I'd say that their time would probably be better spent trying to actually solve our transportation problems. And when you look at us having a $720 million bond here in Austin, we could use a lot more help from the state. Um, and so I would say that's probably a better use of their time. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, the voters here spoke. The city council, who was voted in by the voters, they spoke. And uh, it turns out that it's really not that big of a deal. You know, the, they, they go in, they get their fingerprints, and we pay for it. Uh, after, you know, 20 trips with Ride Austin, they show that, hey, we're in it with you, and we'll, we'll reimburse them for that, for that cost of $40. And a lot of the drivers like it, honestly. They feel like it helps build that trust between themselves and the, and the customer. And uh, at the end of the day, what it would provide if that did happen is a real choice, right? And so, like you mentioned before, uh, if, it was a, um, if it was a preference for riders that they wanted to go with a company that uh, goes the extra mile, because uh, we also do in-person interviews and car inspections of every driver and every car. And so I think that's really important to people when they know that. Well, I know you're not the boss, but I'm sure this has been discussed. Again, would, would you keep fingerprinting? Or, or, or is that an undetermined thing? Well, I'd say it's probably, we probably would. I don't see why we wouldn't. Yeah. Right. Um, will the city lobbying team fight that, such a bill? You know, I'm sure it would. Uh, you know, at this point, uh, we believe in local control. We see it as a liberty issue. Uh, we think that uh, cities ought to be able, the people ought to be able to have their elected officials uh, adopt laws that, um, uh, that they want. and. It's the local officials that are accountable to the local people. Uh, there are a lot of people in the state legislature that, that the people in Austin didn't get a chance to, to elect. There's no way for this community to hold a lot of them accountable. Uh, um, but you know, we'll be defending that. We'll be defending the fair chance hiring uh, uh, legislation or ordinance that we passed. Uh, the, the, I would imagine that, that you know, we'll be defending the decisions that uh, we make locally. Uh, can you tell people about Thumbs Up and what's the status of Thumbs Up? Thumbs Up was uh, one, of the, one of the ideas that um, um, I tried to bring out last uh, uh, December and January, maybe as a way of, of uh, avoiding the, the election and avoiding Uber and Lyft uh, having to leave, and that was to have real choice uh, in the community. Uh, so Thumbs Up was uh, the concept of not having the apps, Uber and Lyft, do anything, but uh, to incentivize uh, drivers to go get fingerprinted outside of that system. Uh, what we created was the uh, first third-party independent cross-platform uh, uh, validator badge. They don't exist uh, in, the, in the world right now, but you all know eBay. You go on eBay and you find a vendor who has the, 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 the power seller badge and you know they do a certain amount of volume or they've been around for a certain period of time. Wouldn't it be nice if you went to any of those vendor sites and it was always the same badge and you knew what it, you knew what it meant? Um, you know, on, on, on Airbnb, you can rent somebody's 
uh, house, or you can rent a room in their house, or you can rent their sofa uh, in their living room. Wouldn't it be nice if, if you could know something about the person who was renting your sofa, or if you were renting a sofa, know something about who it is that might be lurking around the sofa all night that you're sleeping there. Wouldn't it be nice to know that they, that they don't have a criminal background, they're not an axe murderer. Uh, and, and to be able to have a badge like that that would just attest to the fact that this person got a fingerprint. It could be passengers uh, on uh, TNCs. And the status. Uh, it's, uh, there's a startup uh, in Austin that's putting that together. They've gotten about a $3 million grant from the federal government. Uh, and I think they'll start moving forward with, a, with a, perhaps a, a whole uh, a menu of uh, third-party independent validator badges that in a sharing economy when we're interacting more and more with people we don't know will help us get uh, information. Right. Yeah, I'd just like to make a comment on that too uh, because one thing that I think the legislature is missing in this picture, because I was in that panel, I was sitting yeah. uh, sitting there listening to that, and I had raised my hand because I, ra I wanted to ask a question, uh, because there was so much talk about innovation and competition and what these local rules are doing to hurt innovation and competition, but uh, the reality is when you look at the picture here, we have more companies doing this uh, than any other city. We have the most competitive market in any other city. And we even have new ancillary startups that are coming up because of this issue. And so really to me is what you, what you see the legislature might end up doing is actually stifling innovation and competition. Because in every other market, there's only one or two companies. And even in this market, you're seeing companies with features that aren't utilized by those other two companies that people are starting to see and uh, we're looking at. And we're incorporating uh, the best of what we see in the marketplace. And I think that in the long run is going to benefit Everybody. In fact, I've often said that I think that Austin, Texas, innovative capital uh, of the country was innovating uh, a little too quickly for Uber and Lyft, uh, a little too disruptive. But they're big companies now, and that happens when you become a good company, you get a little slow, uh, and, and I think that's the work we were doing. Yeah. Well, Bian, let me, uh, let me ask you about Rocky Mountain's activities. You've been here a few months. So, t so tell us what the Institute has been doing and what yeah. actually initiatives might be either on the ground or about to be on the ground. Sure, yeah. So I'll just give a little background on the organization because, uh, you know, we've been here for a year now and um, I know there are plenty of people in this room and in Austin are wondering why there's an organization called Rocky Mountain Institute setting up shop here basically. But uh, we're an environmental energy focused organization based out of um, Boulder, Colorado. And traditionally we've worked in buildings, transportation, industrial processes and electricity, basically to understand what the opportunities are from a business standpoint to transition away from a carbon intensive energy system that's you know, based on fossil fuels. On transportation, that's meant like working on, has meant for the most part working on uh, electric vehicles and looking at the design of vehicles themselves. We took a step back about two years ago, a year and a half ago, and said, you know, we really need to be looking at this from a, a, the whole mobility system. And, and shifting away from, and this is really our theory of a change, is shifting away from a personally owned vehicle paradigm to one that is just just in time. So currently we have a just in case paradigm where our vehicles are basically sit idle 95% of the time. Um, there's a great deal of opportunity to shift away from that. We're seeing a number of reasons to be optimistic for doing that. And you spoke about innovation here in Austin. That was a big part of the reason why we came down here was just this uh, kind of vibrant community, very entrepreneurial community. We looked at a number of different cities around the country with the goal of finding one that we could take everything that we've learned through our research and start implementing some things and help facilitating um, and helping the private sector bring mobility solutions, greater options that are more efficient and sustainable. Um, so we chose Austin. I think we announced it in November. Um, and. And we've been really excited to be here ever since. And so what we've been doing really is um, concentrating first and foremost on commuting in Austin. Uh, there's a great deal of opportunity. We see it's kind of a low-hanging fruit to bring in new options for commuting. It's about 40% of all vehicle miles traveled in Austin is just commuting. So if you can tackle the origin destination piece of that, um, then you can get a, a, you can get, um, a long ways away toward uh, solving some of the issues. Um, public transit still plays a very key role in that. So we have designed this program that's really tackling the first and last mile t issue with public transportation. Very simply put, you know, many people don't take public transportation because the nearest stop is a mile or more from their, their destination. 
Um, there, there's problems getting to their final destination. And it's been a kind of a subject in transportation for quite some time. How do you do that? So we helped bring Chariot to town. This, they just launched last week. And very simply, what they'll be doing is connecting um, it, uh, employees of, currently we have two main em employer partners, uh, gsd &M and Whole Foods. will be connecting employees of those companies to their offices from the Metro Rail stop and the Metro Rapid stop. So, um, so only on the back end, not on only the on the back end for now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there are obviously there's some things that we need to work out on the front end. But um, we saw this as low hanging fruit. We also recognize there's a great deal of need for more services, more frequency out on the east side and other parts of Austin. But we just wanted to try to get a quick win um, up on the wall and in and more given that fact that we're a nonprofit, um, I think we're in a position to to take what we learn from that program and share it with the rest of the country and the world. And that's kind of, in essence, what we're doing. We call um, Austin our lead implementation city. And so in the next couple of years, we want to start spreading what we learn out to other cities. I think the hard part for the, most of us that aren't in your world, they're uh, inside your walls or inside Boulder, is <laughs> can a metro area like Austin, which is large and spread out and, and nowhere near as dense as places like New York and Chicago and Boston, can, can a place with our setup meaningfully transition to anything other than single or double occupant vehicles? So some of my work is focused on land use as well, so I give that a lot of thought. Um, the, uh, certainly there are some areas I think Austin can improve on density, and that's certainly the part of the, the uh, conversation with Code Next, and it's why Code Next and future land use plans for Austin are so integral and so interrelated with transportation. And that, that there's, there's a tremendous amount of talented people on staff working through that right now. I would, I would definitely stress that Code Next is one of the most critical important uh, things in the future of Austin from our standpoint. But um, you know, I think given the design of the city, it has kind of helped proliferate some of these private services as well. Um, I think it's part of the reason why ride sharing in Austin, it's one of the fastest growing um, cities in, in the country for ride sharing. And you know, there, there may be some density issues in, in parts of the city, but um, it has in a way enabled the private sector to come in and, and, and fill in the gaps. And to all three of you, I'll just throw the rail question out there. We've, we've had three rail elections in Austin, and uh, it was defeated in 2000, and then there was a smaller version that is now on the ground, a single commuter line that passed in 2004, and then Austin said no again in 2014. I just wonder what your thoughts are about the seeming resistance to rail here when it's in other Texas cities and other places. And uh, have we missed the boat because of the changing situation with federal funding uh, that they don't support as much of it now? So my sense of that is that uh, we have 2 million people in the MSA today, metropolitan area. Uh, we're the fastest growing metropolitan area in the country, have been for the last five years each year. Uh, we just got the census numbers and the projections that came out earlier this week, and they project that uh, Austin metropolitan area will go over 4 million people by 2040, and that we will be the fastest growing metropolitan area in that period of time as well. It's hard for me to imagine how you move that many people around without some kind of mass transportation system. Uh, and, and as you look around the world at the ones that work, the ones that work best are, are rail. Uh, so I think you have to be planning not just for who we are today, but, but who we will ultimately be. The question that you raise in terms of Money. funding uh, is, is obviously the, the big issue, uh, which is um, uh, one of the reasons why I am not promoting rail now and did not uh, push to make it part of the, 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 the or vote to make it part of the, the bond election that we have coming up. When you look at other cities, how they have been able to transition into or test for their communities a rail option, uh, some of them started with smaller projects than the one that we were looking at before that were keyed to the most trafficked areas that they had, and they were small enough projects that the financial lift was not as great. Uh, and then it lets the community see, and the community can then touch it and feel it and, and taste it. Uh, and my guess would be that if we go that direction, 
that it would probably be following that kind of a, that 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 kind of a model. Yeah, you know, Houston was maybe seven miles. This one was nine or ten miles, but. I don't know about Dallas. It's back in the 80s. I, I'm not sure whether they went half of the red line right away or the blue line. But, um, I, I meant to ask you a while ago, uh, on bond elections, obviously sure. there's a tax impact. So I wanted you to give, give you a chance to talk about the, what the tax impact is going to be if the bond passes. And there is in this. The, uh, the tax impact is uh, less than $5 a month to the, to the median home. A home value to two hundred to tax value of uh, two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars, so it's a it's a it's a relatively small amount at less than five dollars for for what it is that we get. Uh, that still preserves, by the way, uh, about two hundred and fifty million dollars in bonding that we can do as a community without raising tax rates mm -hmm. uh, from where they are. And we formed a citizens bond commission, seeded it with that two hundred fifty million dollars, so they can start looking at other things. Uh, affordable housing, open space, parks, libraries, uh, that kind of thing. But, but with rail, I mean, absent, you know, something from the legislature, how do you ever get to one billion, two billion, three billion, whatever it takes to build even a starter system? Because the one that we turned down was 1.4 billion. It was, and, and, and I'm not sure that that was the route that was best in terms of the, the, the transportation need, and, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that it needed to be quite that long, and I don't know that it needed to cross the river. Uh, so if you're trying to get something that costs less in order to prove a concept, I'm not sure that that was the right project to choose. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. I mean, and if you look at what's happening to the legislature right now, it's the, the high speed rail that is on the tip of lots of people's tongues at the legislature right now. Uh, that would join uh, Dallas to Houston, almost by way of College Station on a high-speed rail, is uh, entirely uh, privately financed. Uh, and uh, they're not seeking any public uh, uh, funding for that. Uh, in uh, the Campo the other day, we uh, are beginning to initiate a study uh, that would have us looking at the corridor between San Antonio and Austin from 281 out to SH-130 to take a look at feasibility in those questions. And we've asked Amtrak right now to take a look at uh, uh, what they could uh, do because uh, Amtrak has the ability to, 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 to use the, the Union Pacific uh, line, even in situations where Union Pacific doesn't want their lines to be used that way. So I, the answer to your question is I don't know. Yeah. But uh, it's certainly worth us looking at and studying and seeing, seeing what, we could, uh, what we could learn. Can we talk about expectations? You know, Austin, uh, you have a lot of people around here who were here when it was 500,000 people and, or less, and spaces uh, before you got to Pflugerville or before you got to Buter and Kyle. Is it a realistic expectation for people that they, that they shouldn't have to deal with what we're having to deal with? Or is that just the, the price of being attractive and, and, and having two million people and up uh, is there, is there a question of managing expectations? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I mean, the, the, the traffic problem that we have is not going to go away in the short term. Uh, the solutions that we're putting on the table right now uh, would be real effective in preventing us from going where we might go. The, the corridor studies, for example, say if we don't do this work, uh, congestion goes up by sometimes 200% uh, on some of these corridors, which mm -hmm. is unimaginable. Uh, I think uh, if you're actually riding those roads during peak times. That's an expectation you can't manage. <laughs> if, you, if you actually do this work, uh, the, the studies show that at dozens of intersections, uh, the delay times actually get improved uh, from anywhere from 15 to 40 percent. So it's a pretty wide uh, swing. But the real changes, I think, in terms of, of an expectation will happen when things happen considerably differently. Uh, automated vehicles, when, uh, when that first concept first came, uh, I was talking to university experts in the field that said it was going to be 20 years before we saw that on the road, that it was an interesting technology. Uh, Atlantic Magazine uh, ran a piece uh, April, I think of last year, could have been the April before, uh, that said um, uh, automated buses uh, no time soon was the cover story on the Atlantic and in September. Atlantic came out and they had a picture of the automated bus on the road in China announcing that, which gives new meaning to the phrase no time soon. It's about six months, I think. Uh, so, so 
But the technology solutions that are coming to this city, Chariot is one, Bridge uh, is, is another that's operating right now in Kansas City where it's like Uber uh, kind of concept for buses where you walk outside and you say where you are and where you want to go. And a, and a bus bigger than a van, smaller than a, than a bus comes in and picks you up, not on a fixed route, but it picks you up and it starts heading to where you want to go. And along the way, it's picking up more people that are going and dropping people off. And the route of that bus is being changed by the computers as people are getting on and off that bus. It's another first and last mile uh, potential solution. So I think uh, a lot of the new technologies uh, may very well open up doors that, that are not real apparent to us now. I want to open it up to you, you guys. If anybody uh, has a question, well, apparently, <laughs> go ahead. And uh, she has a mic, unless you have a loud voice. I guess everybody can hear me. So I am, I guess, disappointed that the one option that I'm most enthusiastic about has not been brought up yet, even though I think the city has set aside some money to study it, which is the Donald's option. And that was proposed, don't laugh, no. That was proposed at the TED conference here in 2011. It was done by Frog Design downtown. It makes an enormous amount of sense compared to fixed rail track. It solves a huge number of problems and other cities have done it. And I figured I got here about six miles per hour and it would go at 12, so <laughs> there you go. Let's, any, any reaction to that? The CTRMA, CTRMA, I, just recently agreed to do a feasibility study on it, which I think is the, the most person, important first step. Um, so they're going to be looking at it um, and what the viability is in, in the city of Austin. So it was. A, I know there are a lot of people in this community that are interested in that option, and they're excited about that being elevated with CTRMA. Elevated. Yeah. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, I'd like us to be looking at lots of different kinds of ideas, and I'm happy that that's being looked at as well. I'll get to you next. Go ahead. Thank you for taking my, my question. My name is Michael Lewis, and uh, this is for you, Mayor. Good to see you again. Uh, Uber and Lyft, when they came here, they was definitely innovators. And uh, I'm one of the people who's been here since 1988, and I did an internship in 84, and uh, getting around was really, really nice then. Um, based on what you know now about Uber and Lyft, um, do you think they will ever come back to Austin if even if they decide to do fingerprinting and, and, and was fingerprinting the, the major issue? Well, you know, I think that, that we ended up in that election because Uber and Lyft didn't want to be in a community that had choice. Uh, we were trying to set up initially a, a structure where they wouldn't have to change their app, but we could have choice. That was something that they didn't want to be part of. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think it would be great if Uber and Lyft came back. There's nothing in our ordinances now that stop them from coming back. Uh, Uber and Lyft are spending a lot of money on new technologies, on automated cars, on carpooling, on other things that uh, our companies that are starting uh, might not have the bandwidth at this point to be able to invest in. Uh, so uh, 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 we'll have to see how that goes. But there are a lot of reasons why they would want to be here. There's a lot of reasons why we would want them to have them here. Uh, but I will say also that I'm really excited that we are the only open TNC market in a major city in the world. And what we're finding you have when that happens is you would expect there to be competition and innovation uh, when that happens in the marketplace. And that's what we're, that's what we're, we're seeing. So it's a different city than it was when they left. And certainly, they're 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 more than welcome and invited to to come back. Thank you. What about OPAC? Um, so I, I sit on OPAC for about an hour and a half every day. Um, a lot of the stuff is bought from Costco. It doesn't take from the state breaking up OPAC. So the uh, uh, you know as Ben has written. Uh, you know, my first focus, uh, because I was also on the roads, uh, I was looking at Mopac and 183 and, and I-35. Um, those are pretty heavy lifts. Those are real expensive uh, projects to be done. Uh, and what's happening right now is the state and the region are stepping forward with respect to those. So the 183 project at Bluestein is funded and under construction. Uh, 183 in the, in the north and northwest. Uh, uh, is funded and under construction. Mopac North. Uh, oh, no, I think it's just funded. Just funded. Uh, Mopac uh, on the north 
Uh, I understand that there's a, uh, a light at the end of the tunnel and it's not a train. Uh, in fact, um, uh, Ben was, uh, was one, the first person to ride first on the, paying civilian I have to first paying <laughs> civilian to, to, to ride in the managed lane on the section that has just uh, opened uh, and I think that uh, we're all hoping that that uh, technology um, uh, actually uh, helps uh, with with congestion uh, but that funding is there the funding has been set up for Mopac South obviously it's involved in some legal issues uh, at this point uh, and I-35, uh, 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 in, in projects that are being, quite frankly, uh, led uh, by uh, Senator uh, Watson, uh, is looking like it may very well bring about $4 billion to be spent on I-35 between SH-45 to the north and SH-45 to the, to the south. So, so those projects are happening outside of us. Uh, that's why our bond focuses on the other streets and is aimed at trying to to leverage and draw down as much of that uh, additional state and regional money, federal money, as we can. And the rest of the, uh, the uh, Mo North MOPAC project, they don't want to make any predictions anymore, but sometimes under their breath, uh, they're saying late spring. We'll see. Uh, they've missed some before. Other questions? Go ahead. Is there any chance of getting Uber back? Because I would take Uber through the airport or sometimes if a friend came into town and they want to stay in the neighborhood, get the Uber and go to the UT club and want, you know, do a trip rally or something. Well, actually, they're, they're right over there, several. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, right. If the statewide law passes and makes regulations the same here, I think almost certainly they'd come back. If it doesn't pass, I don't know. Uh, want to jump my, my, my hope is still so, you know, again, because I think there are advantages uh, of having the companies here. Uh, but we're in a different city than we were before. Uh, there are certainly uh, 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 TNCs that are operating right now. I mean, there was a fear when we did ACL that the city would, 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 would fall apart and that uh, we would all be seeing lots of things on social media about the breakdown at ACL. It was a large number of people to come in, and, and that hasn't happened that way. Uh, the ridership is growing on the TNC. So you, you got used to using Uber, and unless and until Uber comes back, there are you know, five or six others that you should, you should try. They, they work very similarly um, uh, to, to use. But I think you know, it's, it's, there are a lot of things that are, that are in motion um, yeah. right now and will be over the next year. Well, I never had a case of good luck with Uber. Noted. <laughs> yes, sir. Ask you if you could give us a little bit of insight into the negotiations that went along on, within City Council between you and Uber and Lyft. I know that you had a lot of back backdoor meetings, and I wanted to get some insight into that because one of the major criticisms that I've heard from people is that you were applying old economy rules to a gig economy, and that there, there was a lack of understanding at City Council of what Uber and Lyft actually were. In those negotiations, was there a sense of a give and take that maybe Uber and Lyft would be able to move on this item, but not on this, and you would be able to move on one item or another? And what were those? Where is there room for compromise, I suppose, is the question. Well, I think, I think that, that, that everybody now is in a different place than we were a year ago. Uh, and, and in a lot of respects, there are different people that are involved now than a year ago. Uh, but where that debate happened a year ago uh, was, uh, uh, we had a uh, increased number of sexual assaults that were happening among uh, uh, people that were riding in TNCs. We also had sexual assaults of people that were riding in taxi cabs. What we had were um, uh, uh, 20, 25 year old women incapacitated, they had drunk too much, and their friends were pouring them into the back of cars. Uh, and either on the way home or when they got home, they were being assaulted. The lesson to be learned from that, by the way, I think, is that if you're wanting to help a friend who doesn't, lacks capacity, don't put them in the back of any car. Take them home and then come back to where it was that you, you were before. But we had our, our, our public safety people were telling the council that it's better to have a fingerprint than not a fingerprint if for no other reason it helps with post-incident investigation and prosecution. So we started looking at that question. Uber and Lyft came in and said it doesn't fit with our business model. Uh, and we began to have a standoff between some members on the council that wanted to have a mandatory system based on what we were hearing from our public safety people and, and people that were liking the service and saying it, it doesn't fit with the technologies and the onboarding processes. 
um, um, uh, there were several of us, myself included, that stepped into the, to the middle of that and said, you know, there's probably a way we can work both these. If we can get the number of fingerprinted drivers up sufficiently high so that anybody who wants goes out and calls for a car has just as good chance of getting someone who's fingerprinted and, and as is not, then they have a meaningful choice. So we went to Uber and Lyft and we said, let us drive the participation in the community. Let us take the percentage up so it would be sufficiently high to be able to, to, to do that. And we'll run incentives that are outside of the uh, app and outside of the onboarding process. Quite frankly, we had some opposition from some of the members of our council that said, nope, it's got to be mandatory. And Uber and Lyft uh, were not ready to uh, be in a community that had that kind of choice that was presented. Uh, uh, I think in part because they weren't sure how that would be communicated around the world because they're not just in Austin, they're around the world and it, it, it confused the, the messaging and the branding. Um, and, and what happened was is while we were in those conversations, uh, we, we, it stopped and we went to an election. Uh, had we had more time, had we not uh, stopped progress and had conversations, if we had had another month or two back in January and February, my belief is we may have been able to work out something. But as soon as the election was set, at that point, the discussion's over. Uh, the, the voters are, are presented with a binary binary choice. Maybe one more. Ben has to, to, to be out of here in about three or four minutes. Yes. Yes, I really... Really enjoyed the panel. Uh, really enjoyed this panel. Sorry if the sound. Um, and I certainly support uh, the bond initiative in Thank a you. general sense. But I wonder about this whole thought of having a collaborative community. And are we expending our political capital on this initiative? We can never spend enough money. And Mayor, you brought out some great points about the underspending and underfunding that the city has done relative to the state and the regional side. So um, I'm wondering if the public really is fully aware of the mobility bond, the components of that. You've explained it fairly well tonight, but I'm not sure when you package that much in a bond program whether the community fully understands it. Hopefully, maybe it does pass. But I'm, I'm thinking that with the Rocky Mountain Institute of how you're looking at kind of the nexus of things, the, the demand and the supply, we can never build enough capacity with right-of-way issues and funding issues. So I'm wondering about, you know, really providing for the future and maybe engaging the creative economy that we have here. Certainly a lot has been done, but maybe initiatives that engage the college, the universities, maybe even high schools that create kind of a think tank that bring all these organizations together that supports a political process and maybe some technological creativity that supports things, whether it's uh, could be the ride sharing, the gig sharing, activities. It could be uh, van pools and things. I grew up in California. There's van pooling. The corporations don't seem to be really engaged in these things, but when they come here, they want to know that there's transportation provided or some A lot in there. Any reaction? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I would say that's precisely what we wanted to do in coming down here is to help kind of foster that collaborative community. And we've been really impressed with just work, with everybody we've worked with, from Austin Transportation Department, to Downtown Austin Alliance and Movability Austin, University of Texas, just this you know, broad array of, um, of stakeholders in the city. And you know, we have a lot of engineers on staff, but we also, we, we're not, in our role, we're not really playing traffic engineers. Um, or we're, not, we're not playing that role in our work. We, we really are trying to kind of play this convening role where trying to get more options to the city of Austin and just try things out. Um, I think the mayor has said many times, we're not a city that's afraid to fail and try new things. That's kind of where the role we want to play, you know? So if it's a commuting service or it's an electric taxi fleet or something like that, we, we'd like to try that out and um, be completely transparent with the results. We're doing, we're doing all the things that you asked about. All those things are happening in this city right now on a hundred different places and in a hundred different ways. One, one quick one. A question so much as a reminder that the November 8th ballot is a very long ballot, and this issue is at the very bottom of that. Just a warning that if you choose to vote a straight ticket, you have to look and review your ballot at the end and see who you voted for or didn't vote for. Be sure and go back 
and vote for those other down ballots that are not politically partisan. The city council members, the AISD trustees, the ACC board members, and the bodies. Very true. Thank you very much. Well, okay. So one more question. <laughs> so when I, when I was born in Austin, there was about 385,000 people here. So I just cringe when you say in 2040 we're going to have you know, four million people on our MSA. Also, by that time, at five dollars a month, I would pay uh, you know more than twelve hundred dollars in increased taxes from this bar. And when I'm at that moment, I would want to go back to tonight and ask, why don't we build rail or some kind of? Why don't we invest in our mass transit, even in an iterative way, starting way back in, way back in? This moment in time. So why you know you talked about we're gonna need that, but why not start focusing on that now? Why do we why do we pass up on the opportunity to try again, tweak and, and build iteratively on this uh, rail that we've already invested in? We should have. I got here in nineteen seventy eight. We didn't have three hundred and eighty five thousand people at that point, and it's good to see a unicorn in the crowd. <laughs> uh, I think because the, the do nothing voices in this city have always been very, very strong. Uh, and, and at each point in the process that we've had that, nothing anybody's proposed has been perfect, um, uh, I think. We just have a community that culturally um, uh, resists change. We have a community that culturally wants a solution to be perfect. We just have a, a, a city that culturally is, is reticent to, to try things like this and to move forward and to make commitments. Um, and I think that's part of what this bond is. We're fighting the, the same people who are the do nothing voices in this bond election are the same people who are the do nothing voices in, in, in repeated things, not just transportation, uh, but, but it's the same people, it's the same kind of ad campaigns, it's the same kind of signs, it's the same kind of messaging. Uh, and as a community, I think uh, we, we, have to, we have to move to a new place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.